Like football, today's lesson that covers verses 1 to 5 of chapter 4 is in two halves. In the first three verses, we will look at the theme of covetousness examined. In the last two verses, we will see covetousness condemned. Because we live in such a materialistic society, I think the majority of us have become so desensitised to the issue of covetousness that we don't even realise that we have a problem with it. It can be defined as a craving for possessions or power, often with strong emotions. For sure, we may avoid the extreme forms that feature on reality TV shows, but the everyday bombardment we face to acquire a little more, to have the latest, is a problem we all face. In the previous chapter, James had dealt with the problem of the tongue, and this leads naturally into this chapter, fights and quarrels. Sadly, if you look at the history of the church, it has been marked by just this. The non-Christian thinks that many of the problems in the world are due to religion. Whilst this is simplistic, and not really true. Our collective behaviour as Christians has given superficial grounds for thinking just that. We need to be better than that. Godly wisdom is peace-loving, and it is this characteristic that should mark us and stands in direct contrast to covetousness, which only leads to dissatisfaction and conflict. Verse 2 uses strong language to make the point. Of course, most of us are unlikely to be murderers in the literal sense. However, James teaches us that this strong desire for what we do not have will lead to the same emotions that do cause us to murder, hatred. In God's eyes, this is just as serious. Matthew 5, 21 to 22. I want to consider a couple of examples to show what I mean. I long for the church that I attend to grow, so that people will start to ask me, what is the secret to your success? I cover power and prestige. When someone suggests a different programme of outreach or points out problems in what I'm suggesting, I exchange sharp words and with an unforgiving spirit, there is a division between us. I try to find supporters for my point of view and spread rumours about those who don't agree, dressed up in the most spiritual language, of course. Before long, the whole church is split. Instead of growing, we're shrinking. Does that sound like an outlandishly ex exaggerated example to you? Alternatively, I long for the kind of car that they have next door. I do all the overtime I can get, so missing out on regular church fellowship. Finally, I can afford it, and so trade up, only to find that next door have moved on as well. And so the cycle starts again. Instead of my prayer life being full of thankfulness, the undertones have started. Why me? It's not fair. Everyone else has a nicer house, car, holiday. For them it's so effortless. Before long my heart is full of suspicion of others and its stone coldness grows lonely and isolated. Does that sound far-fetched? Something that could never happen to me? We have a euphemism, keeping up with the Joneses. But really we need to call it out for what it is. Greed. Envy. What we are really saying though we would never use these words, is that God's provision for me is insufficient. In some way or other, God is selling me short and withholding something that I deserve, something that would be good for me. I become bitter in my spiritual core and my relationship with God and then with others suffers. And it can so easily happen, so quickly we hardly notice. We need to be really careful about which websites we visit, about what programmes we watch. I'm not saying never, 
just issuing a massive health warning that we are potentially exposing ourselves to forces we may struggle to master. James also mentions the remedy in these verses, prayer. Not asking for what I want from wrong motives, but following the example of the Lord Jesus. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In addressing the relatively young Timothy, he said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Focusing on those inner characteristics that mark our Father and learning to be content with what God has given us is the mark of genuine spiritual maturity. In his letter to the young Christians in Philippi, Paul says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Philippians 4 and verse 12. It is a learning process. It will not happen overnight, but I do need to discipline myself to know that everything that God wants me to have, he will give me in his good time. He knows me better than I know myself, and his plan for me is better than anything that I could plan for myself. These are true realities that I need to fill my thought life with every day before I allow the ads, the wants, the aspirations of this world to stun my senses and break my common sense into wanting what I don't have. In verses 4 to 5, we see covetousness rebuked. I want you to picture your wedding day. You arrive at the church and there at the top of the aisle is your groom, waiting and ready. As you make your way up the aisle, you notice the best man. He looks mighty fine in his white suit and flashy shoes. Before the first hymn has finished, you're outrageously flirting with him right under the nose of the man you're about to marry. You're about to promise undying love to him, and yet there you are with eyes for another. Clearly something is very wrong here. We all would recognise the inappropriateness of these actions. Sadly, we don't so easily recognise them in our daily actions. We are promised to Christ. And yet we flirt with the world on a daily basis, longing for what it has to offer. This world that rejected him 2,000 years ago, and still does, holds such an attraction for us. I just want a little bit more of it. Just a little bit more. James is really clear here. As we want to fit in with the world and crave all that it has to offer, it's materialism, its possessions, a voice, and all the countless other values it has, we will be at enmity with God. To use the words of Joshua as he faced the nation of Israel towards the end of his life, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. We just cannot serve two masters. We can't say that we love the Lord Jesus and then desire the things that come from a system that still rejects his authority. Verse 5 is a bit tricky to understand, as evidenced by the various ways in which Bible translations differ. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say what James claims to quote. It is possible to understand this as referring to the general tenor of the Old Testament. Perhaps better, it is to understand what James says as two related questions. Do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? Does the spirit which has taken his abode in us desire enviously? To which the answer is no to the first question and yes to the second. The second problem is whose spirit is referred to? Is it the Holy Spirit of God? In which case, the meaning is that it is not the Holy Spirit which causes us to covet. We're acting out of character. The Holy Spirit is jealous to ensure we are faithful to Christ alone. How hurt he must be when we desire so much that God has not given us 
attracted to these things more than we are to Christ. Alternatively, it may be our spirit, in which case James identifies the source of all our unfaithfulness to God. And in being told of the source, we need to put it to death. As Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. It's time to wake up and smell the coffee. Materialism, consumerism, covetousness are a real problem for us and will corrode our spiritual health.